and welcome back to my blog. We're on to part six of Sophisms of the Protectionists by Bastiat. Sophisms of Protection part one, and this is a chapter called Balance of Trade. Our adversaries have adopted a system of tactics, which embarrasses us not a little. Do we prove our doctrine? They admit the truth of it in the most respectful manner. Do we attack their principles? They abandon them with the best possible grace. They only ask that our doctrine, which, acknowledges, which they acknowledge to be true, should be confined to books, and that their principles, which they allow to be false, should be established in practice. If we will give up to them the regulation of our tariffs, they will leave us triumphant in the domain of theory. Assuredly, said Mr. Gauthier de Rumilly lately, Assuredly, no one wishes to call up from their graves the defunct theories of the balance of trade. And yet, Mr. Gauthier, after giving this passing blow to error, goes on immediately afterwards and for two hours consecutively to reason as though this error were a truth. Give me Mr. Leste Boudoir. Here we have a consistent reasoner, a logical arguer. There is nothing in his conclusions which cannot be found in his premises. He asks nothing in practice, which he does not justify in theory. His principles may perchance be false, and this is the point in question. But he has a principle. He believes, he proclaims aloud, that if France gives ten to receive fifteen, she loses five. And surely, with such a belief, nothing is more natural than that he should make laws consistent with it. He says, what it is important to remark is that constantly the amount of importation is augmenting and surpassing that of exportation. Every year France buys more foreign produce and sells less of its own produce. This can be proved by figures. In 1842, we see the importation exceed the exportation by 200 millions. This appears to me to prove, in the clearest manner, that national labor is not sufficiently protected that we are provided by foreign labor and that the competition of our rivals, rivals oppresses our industry. The law in question appears to me to be a consecration of the fact that our political economists have assumed a false position in declaring that in proportion to produce bought there is always a corresponding quantity sold. It is, it is evident that purchases may be made not with the habitual production of a country, not with its revenue, not with the results of actual labor, but with its capital, with the accumulated savings which should serve for reproduction. A country may spend, dissipate its profits and savings, may impoverish itself, and by the consumption of its national capital, progress gradually to its ruin. This is precisely what we are doing. We give every year 200 millions to foreign nations. Well, here at last is a man whom we can understand. There is no hypocrisy in this language. The balance of trade is here clearly maintained and defended. France imports 200 millions more than she exports. Then France loses 200 millions yearly. And the remedy? It is to check importation. The conclusion is perfectly consistent. It is then with Mr. Leste Baudois that we will argue, for how is it possible to do so with Mr. Gauthier? If you say to the latter, the balance of trade is a mistake, he will answer, so I have declared it in my exordium. If you exclaim, but it is the truth, he will say, thus I have classed it in my conclusions. Political economists may blame me for arguing with Mr. Leste Boudoir to combat the balance of trade is, they say, neither more nor less than to fight against a windmill. But let us be on our guard. The balance of trade is neither so old, nor so sick, nor so dead, as Mr. Gauthier is pleased to imagine. For all the legislature, Mr. Gauthier himself included, are associated by their votes with the theory of Mr. Leste Baudois. However, not to fatigue the reader, I will not seek to investigate too closely this theory, but will content myself with subjecting it to the experience of facts. It is constantly alleged in opposition to our principles that they are good only in theory. But, gentlemen, do you believe that merchants' books are good in practice? It does appear to me that if there is anything which can have a practical authority when the object is to prove profit and loss, that this must be commercial accounts. We cannot suppose that all merchants of the world for centuries back should have so little understood their own affairs as to have kept their books in such a manner as to represent gains as losses and losses as gains. 
Truly, it would be easier to believe that Mr. Lesti Boudoir is a bad political economist. A merchant, one of my friends, having had two business transactions with very different results, I have been curious to compare on this subject the accounts of the counter with those of the custom house, interpreted by Mr. Lesti Boudoir with the sanction of our 600 legislators. Mr. T, dispatched from Havre a vessel, freighted for the United States with French merchandise, principally Parisian articles, valued at 200,000 francs. Such was the amount entered at the Custom House. The cargo, on its arrival at New Orleans, had paid 10% expenses and was liable to 30% duties, which raised its value to 280,000 francs. It was sold at 20% profit on its original value, which being 40,000 francs, the price of sale was 320,000 francs, which the assignee converted into cotton. This cotton, again, had to pay for expenses of transportation, insurance, commissions, etc., 10%. So that when the return cargo arrived at Havre, its value had risen to 352,000 francs, and it was thus entered at the Custom House. Finally, Mr. T realized again on this return cargo 20% profits, amounting to 70,400 francs. The cotton thus sold for the sum of 422,400 francs. If Mr. Lesti Boudoir requires it, I will send him an extract from the books of Mr. T. He will there see credited to the account of profit and loss, that is to say, set down as gained two sums, the one of 40,000, the other of 70,000 francs. And Mr. T feels perfectly certain that as regards these, there is no mistake in his accounts. Now, what conclusion does Mr. Lesti Boudoir draw from the sums entered into the Custom House in this operation? He thence learns that France has exported 200,000 francs and imported 352,000, from whence the Honorable Deputy concludes that she has spent, dissipated the profits of her previous savings, that she is impoverishing herself and progressing to her ruin, and that she has squandered on a foreign nation 152,000 francs of her capital. Sometime after this transaction, Mr. T dispatched another vessel, again freighted with domestic produce, to the amount of 200,000 francs. But the vessel foundered after leaving the port, and Mr. T had only further to inscribe on his books two little items thus worded. Sundries due to X, 200,000 francs, for purchase of diverse articles dispatched by vessel N. Profit and loss due to sundries, 200,000 francs, for final and total loss of cargo. In the meantime, the Custom House inscribed 200,000 francs upon its list of exportations. And as there can, of course, be nothing to balance this entry on the list of importations, it hence follows that Mr. Lesti Boudoir and the Chamber must see in this wreck a clear profit to France of 200,000 francs. We may draw hence yet another conclusion, viz., that according to the balance of trade theory, France has an exceedingly simple manner of constantly doubling her capital. It is only necessary to accomplish this, that she should, after entering into the custom house her articles for exportation, cause them to be thrown into the sea. By this course, her exportations can speedily be made to equal her capital. Importations will be nothing, and our gain will be all which the ocean will have swallowed up. You are joking, the protectionist will reply. You know that it is impossible that we should utter such absurdities. Nevertheless, I answer, you do utter them, and what is more, you give them life. You exercise them practically upon your fellow citizens as much, at least, as is in your power to do. The truth is that the theory of the balance of trade should be precisely reversed. The profits accruing to the nation from any foreign commerce should be calculated by the overplus of the importation above the exportation. This overplus, after the deduction of expenses, is the real gain. Here we have the true theory, and it is one which leads directly to freedom in trade. I now, gentlemen, abandon you this theory, as I have done all those of the preceding chapters. Do with it as you please. Exaggerate it as you will. It has nothing to fear. Push it to the farthest extreme. Imagine, if it so please you, that foreign nations should inundate us with useful produce of, produce of every description and ask nothing in return. That our importations should be infinite, and our exportations nothing. Imagine all this, 
And still, I defy you to prove that we will be the poorer in consequence. I believe that's the end of balance of trade. More tomorrow. Make it a great day, and bye for now.